Welcome to part three of the Atheist Alpha course, which for those of you just joining, aims to give a blueprint for modern living and the insights and tools you need to have a great life without the need for worshiping a false deity. And it uses ridicule of religion as a vehicle. This part three focuses on ethics, free will and morality, explains why moderation in religious belief is bankrupt and also it has an atheist test. The final part four puts things in an historical context, explains why secularism without religion is the way forward and has some suggestions on what you can do to help. So we would say free yourself from this primitive superstitious nonsense called religion. Just because you have a predilection through evolution to believe in a false god doesn't mean to say you have to. But you do have to be willing to change your mind and not accept what someone else says is divinely right. Don't let someone interpret a book one way and tell you what to do when someone else interprets it another way. Let's first dispel the notion of original sin. Because science has shown us there was a big bang when we evolved through billions of years of evolution, we can be pretty sure that we were not born in sin because the Garden of Eden is disproved. And as there was no original man who had a rib ripped out to make a woman who conversed with a snake and then ate an apple off a magical tree, there is no original sin, therefore there is no need for a saviour. And regarding free will, although there is still debate about whether or not we have it, it certainly is not true that it was given to us by a God. You cannot have an all-knowing God and free will. The two are incompatible. If God is omnipotent and omniscient, he knows the future. Therefore, he knows the destiny of people and everything is predetermined. The irony is in the joke. Do we have free will? Of course we do. The boss said so. Did God give child rapists free will to exist as part of his plan? Do kids with bone cancer exist for his greater purpose? As Epicurus said, if God is willing to prevent evil but not able, he is not omnipotent. If he is able but not willing, he is malevolent. Both willing and able, then why is there evil? And if he is neither able nor willing to stop evil, then why call him God? Anyway, what free will options does a God really give, especially one that we are supposed to love and fear at the same time? As the carrot, all religions have belief as a passport to paradise. And as the stick, we have believe in me or spend eternity burning in hell. This is the essence of sadomasochism. If you are doing something for reward or because of fear of punishment, you do not have free will. At least with a crook, if he holds a gun to your head and commands you, he can only punish you by killing you. With the religion, the God punishes you for all eternity. There are no evil earthquakes or hurricanes. We wouldn't lock them up. But when it comes to humans, it can be argued that they have no more free will than an earthquake or hurricane. That if you were born with the same genes as a mass murderer and we were exposed to the same experiences and upbringing, you would do exactly the same. This takes us back to the argument about free will. There is much debate about this topic and I would encourage you to explore it in greater detail. Society does not believe in vicarious redemption like religion, where you can pass your sins off onto someone else. Imagine being able to kill your next door neighbor and say, sorry God, please forgive me, and the slate was clean. That is the most insidious of the religious beliefs that you can pass the book to a scapegoat. Society presently says you must take responsibility for your actions and use as prison, if not for retribution, then for prevention. So we make the rules which help us by moderating and reinforcing behaviour. And how moral can you be if you act under the auspices of blackmail or bribery anyway? This takes us to moral absolutism and how the hijacking of morality by religion has poisoned mankind. A big argument used by religious people is that even if religion can't give us a scientific explanation of things, religion can help teach us right from wrong. As mentioned, the morals of the holy books sanctioned genocide, slavery and misogyny, and we know we cannot take them as a source of absolute morality. It was morally reasonable to burn people for five centuries in Europe on the basis that heretics should be killed and tortured. It's no longer possible to believe this because we've edited those bad bits out in favour of reason and the common good and because it doesn't stop us focusing on human happiness. There is nothing morally lost for losing God given how sadistic the books are, yet no one says these books are immoral. Bride not a virgin, stone hair to death. Homosexual, stone to death. 
Kids talk back, stoned to death. Someone talking to a foreign god, kill him, his family, everyone in town. These are not metaphors, analogies with spiritual struggle within. These are explicit directives to kill people for theological crimes. Jesus said every title of the law has to be obeyed. There are many religiously orientated moral problems that can't be solved due to religion through God belief. Presently, religion has given us money scams, religious war, abuse of politics and laws, condom use as sinful, which serves to promote the spread of HIV, especially in Africa, no rights for women, sectarian strife rights and murder. The forcible child genital mutilation community is exclusively religious. 9-11 attackers, terrorism. The suicide bomber community is exclusively religious. On divine command theory, some Muslims believe blowing themselves up is morally good. Morally normal people find themselves doing extraordinarily bad things when religion is on their side because they have absolute morality on their side in their view. In Iran, a virgin is not allowed to be executed. Maybe she was guilty of a heinous crime, like showing her hair too often, but she can be raped by the Revolutionary Guard and then whipped and stoned to death. ISIS recently killed 15 teenagers for watching a football match, and pigeon breeders as well, because their hobby was declared un-Islamic. In Saudi recently, clerics banned the building of snowmen. Anyone with absolute morality on their side, as interpreted by themselves, can easily hang anyone who is homosexual, a heretic, or even just a political opposition activist. Yet people still say that religion is useful as a utility to give us a moral framework. There is objective morality in the Bible and Quran. If you put aside the terrible things the books say, there are some good rules laid down. You shall not kill, steal, lie, and so on. Yet are we seriously to believe that as a species, we were immoral for between 100 and 200,000 years before a Bronze Age book told us otherwise? It's probably true that those of our primitive ancestors who believed in a god, who had a unifying understanding and purpose, may have had a better chance of survival. And in the same Darwinian way, good and evil probably exist as characteristic traits, because in the past, the survival of the species has sometimes been aided by being selfless, and other times by betrayal or being treacherous. But generally, it's also probably true that it was an evolutionary imperative to help those with similar genes. Altruism and morality came from reciprocal expectations. Psychopaths and sociopaths would have been excluded from the group. Human solidarity and long-term survival demands we forbid certain things, and that's why we don't generally murder, rape, lie and steal. So whilst people are understandably worried that unless we have a moral framework, we will degenerate, we can't use religion as a placebo or a panacea. We are revolted by rape and slavery, yet there are no commandments against them. Atheists have tried to produce a set of ten non-commandments, which would look something like this. You can pause and read them at your leisure. Conversely, Matt Dillahunty ponders things that he might consider sin if the concept of sin were valid. Again, you can pause and read them at your leisure. Atheists are generally wary of absolute morality being prescribed from ancient books because morality can be subjective and liable to change as society changes. If we were to have set absolute morals 250 years ago according to the Bible, we would still have slavery. If we set our parameters of morality 60 years ago, we would still have white and black bathrooms in America. In Britain, consenting adult homosexuals only avoided imprisonment after 1967. The apartheid state of South Africa lasted until 1984. Now we are discussing the morality of same-sex marriages, so the goalposts keep moving all the time. What if you had a culture to make blind every third child, and that culture somehow worked and was successful? Would that be an argument for saying it was a moral society? Of course it wouldn't be. Some modes of moral behaviour are not sustainable. A society that practices incest or cannibalism would die out. The Mayan religion required you sacrifice a teenage girl each year and burn her, and that's no longer acceptable, of course. Presently, we have the Taliban who would argue that making women wear burqas is morally good for human well-being. 
but the Taliban are bringing their own version of hell on earth. The average lifespan in Afghanistan for women is 44, the literacy rate is 12%, they have nearly the highest pregnancy rate and infant mortality rate, GDP is low than in 1820, they have banned music, television and books of various intellectual streams, they are preventing minds from thinking, considering, comparing and choosing. Can we say it is immoral for a father to throw acid in his little girl's face? for the crime of learning to read. It is not unscientific to say that the Taliban are wrong about morality. We have to say this if we know anything about human well-being. We should be able to accept as an absolute that this is wrong. So religion agrees on the need for moral truth, yet morality is subjective. There are facts on one hand and values on the other. We all want love, friendship and community, but the reality is Religion poisons common sense and moral goodness. By contrast, science does focus on values. For instance, we should be able to say that physical health and an average lifespan going from 45 to 85 within a few decades is a good thing. Health has it. No one would argue it's best to vomit constantly and die and that it's just as good morally as living without pain. And we are talking here about the health of societies. How can you get religious people to value logic and sound reasoning rather than self-deception, deriving their morality from an ancient book? You have to believe that human beings are capable of being ethical and moral without religion or a god. So what is the bottom line when it comes to morality? If morals and ethics are man-made, can there be an objective morality grounded in science, the least misery for everyone? People like the neuroscientist Sam Harris are working on a scientific explanation for morality. Although in its infancy, he argues you can have morals without religion, morals in science, a science of morality. Can science tell us how to raise our children or what is a good life? Many believe it can't tell us what we ought to value, yet we make the judgments of right and wrong. We broadcast our preferences on a universe that is value free. If you believe the overriding moral pretext is to reduce human suffering, then you must help develop morality on that basis. So for instance, to improve human well-being, we know it is not right in a health and psychological way now to give cigarettes to three-year-olds. In future, we may be able to say definitively caning in school is psychologically bad for us. So where do our preferences come from? They come from our apish impulses and social emotions, drummed into us by evolution and modulated by cultures, in other words, refined by society. So morality is difficult to prescribe. Presently, we allow smoking, which is bad for us, but ban cannabis. However, it is society that makes the rules, not any fictitious god. We are fairly evolved mammals and have an innate need for a human solidarity and must develop the rules on that basis without religion so we can make laws in mankind's best interests. And although society may not be able to change your morals, society can care and can influence what you do. So if you think being a paedophile is okay, society may not be able to change your belief. But if you go and molest a child, it will lock you up. You are free to believe what you want. In your religion, maybe your interpretation of it makes you believe homosexuals should be stoned to death or you should throw acid in the face of a girl learning to read. But try preaching that and it encourages violence, it conflicts with society and we can lock you up. We can utter ethical remarks without the supernatural. Once the emancipation has begun, you can throw off the celestial dictator. Don't believe in a creator or a supervisor in any degree because it hinders development of the values that would be beneficial to humanity. And that takes us on to why moderate religious believers are bad for mankind. Many people watching this will say, well, this is all very interesting, but it has no relation to me or the people I know. The old lady down the road just goes to church and doesn't harm anyone. I believe in some sort of God, so what harm does it do? Religious moderation has to be criticised. It is better than fundamentalism. Religious moderates don't fly into buildings or blow themselves up, but moderation gives us a huge number of problems, represents the unprincipled use of reason and is intellectually bankrupt. Firstly, moderates are selective. Given how sadistic the Abrahamic books are, there is nothing lost morally for losing God, 
but instead of doing just that, moderate cherry pick. Five centuries ago in Europe, heretics were killed and tortured, burned to death, arguing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's no longer possible to do this or believe this because we've edited these bad bits out in favour of science, humanity and the common good. But the reality is the main monotheistic religious texts are engines of intolerance and fundamentalism. Yet it is nowhere near mainstream to say these books are immoral. We have to cut religions out completely, not ignore the parts we don't like. Being without religion doesn't stop us from focusing on human happiness. Moderates would say there's nothing remotely religious about all this murderous fundamentalism in the world. For example, how do peaceful Christians restrain their members from extremism? Well, the short answer is they didn't. Look at Christians in Africa, the atrocities being carried out by the Lord Resistance Army, or the persecution of homosexuals, the killing of children as witches, systematic abuse and rape of women. The LRA has been accused of widespread human rights violations, including murder, abduction, mutilation, child sex slavery, and forcing children to participate in hostilities. But if you ask a Christian, they say, well, they're not real Christians. They're just using it as an expedient cover. It's a good thing most moderate Christians are ignorant of everything except a few good quotes from the New Testament. If they ever started acting on revelations, they'd be just as repulsive as contemporary radical Muslims. What do you think would have happened to Monty Python and countless other Western comedians three centuries ago had they mocked Jesus Christ? In the same way, Muslim moderates would say the recent outrages are driven by their willfully perverted misinterpretation of the Muslim faith. So they would say whether it is Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, or people trying to establish theocratic authoritarian rule across Western Europe, it is a grotesque warping of theology and nothing to do with them. Yet if there was no religion, there would be no religion to corrupt. There is enough in any of the Abrahamic texts to interpret anything you like. With Bible texts, for example, if you want, you can turn the other cheek to justify non-violence or an eye for an eye to justify violence. Muslims, to further their goals, can just as easily quote love from the Quran or strike terror into the heart of the disbelievers, cut off their heads and cut off their fingertips. That's from Quran 9.29. Religious texts allow for interpretations which excuse such behaviour and back up the fundamentalists who in turn argue that, say, it is moderate Muslims who are not the true believers. And any extremists from this perspective can have true religious and moral reasons, and it is specious to say otherwise. So when 9-11 happened, moderates say, oh, well, 19 men did this, not an entire religion. Atheists say, an entire religion did this to 19 men. Put simply, extremism is pure uncut religion that has not been diluted by secular logic or reason, but it does most accurately reflect true religion as per the holy books. On this basis, there are a lot of good moderate people that are Christians and Muslims, but coincidentally, they're all terrible Christians and Muslims insofar as they disregard a lot of the Bible and Quran. In other words, they're good people because they don't follow their religions very well. Being a good Christian or Muslim on this basis is incompatible with being a good person. Religion is the enemy here and to single out one above another merely helps to continue the cycle. So it has to be understood that moderation is theologically bankrupt. Moderate Christians may say today that they don't believe in the Bible passages detailing how you should punish your slaves and apply their own morality by, say, using a condom, and they don't stone to death the waitress who serves them after church for working on a Sunday. Moderate Muslims may say they don't believe in the part of the Quran about stoning apostates to death, whipping their wives, collecting an unbeliever's tax, but they submit to the will of Allah. Many practicing Christians or Muslims who are not homophobic gloss over the parts they don't like. Most churches and mosques practice self-censorship and focus on the good parts, but they directly inhibit our ability to stop hate preaching. How can you condemn a radical mullah spewing bile when a Catholic priest across the road is saying homosexuality is an abomination and all gays are going to hell? Many Muslims go to mosques 
that don't pedal hate or ignore the hate pedaled because that doesn't chime with their sense of fairness and morality. It is called cognitive dissonance. Sometimes people hold a core belief, like God, that is very strong. When they are presented with evidence against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It will create a feeling that is very uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalise, ignore or even deny anything that doesn't fit in with that core belief. So it can be seen that religious moderates are selective. Secondly, moderates don't talk about evidence, they talk about meaning. For example, religion gives me comfort, it's a rock in my life. This has prestige despite it being illogical. Take as an example having a neighbour who believes he has a diamond as big as a bucket buried in his backyard. He likes to dig for it every Sunday. This conviction gives him comfort and meaning and purpose to him and his family. He invites others round to dig as it gives him a sense of community and cohesion. He knows he'll get there someday. You would think he was nuts. Yet yeah, people happily go to church every Sunday to worship a park god baby born from a virgin that comes back from the dead. So the search for meaning, purpose or identity is not credible once taken out of the religious sphere. But it has to be understood that moderation is theologically bankrupt. Thirdly, we are all victims of the same hypocrisy. Let's be honest, many people go to church not for theological reasons, but for pragmatic reasons. Social interaction, a business deal, to get your kid into the right school, organise a round of golf, socio-economic community ties to help your fellow man, like jumble sales or welfare soup kitchens, or just to connect with your family and friends and feel it isn't all about the money. We need to foster and organise the structure of a community that is not built on this false deity from our primitive beginnings. Fourthly, even without extremism, religions are powerful pressure groups that influence our society in evil and subtle ways. Religious property and assets being exempt from tax gives huge funds to exert influence, particularly with the Christian right in America. In Britain, religious groups attack in a hundred different ways, from bishops in the House of Lords voting against stem cell research, to promoting homosexual inequality, or forbidding contraception, subjugating women, or Muslims insisting on halal food, or pork taken off a menu in a school, religions set the agenda. They also get a free ride. They can sanctimoniously complain about, say, the growth in food banks without having to balance the books like the politicians and say where to make cuts. And fifthly, and perhaps most importantly, while religious extremists cause the most obvious death, hatred, conflict and misery, Moderates give cover to fundamentalists. All religions want respect, no matter how silly their views. It's hard to condemn extremism if you have to respect faith when it is taboo to criticise. All monotheistic religions hurt society. In the developed world, three centuries of enlightenment have slowly had an effect. Many Muslims born in the West are as moderate as modern Christians. Pressures are still on in the host nations, partially down to radical preaching and partly because of immigration. A lot of Islamic country-born people are coming from the Middle East where religious indoctrination and extremism is common amongst the general population. You could argue that it's just a matter of time. Maybe in two or three generations, all Muslims in the West will be fully assimilated and the Middle East will have moderated. Don't count on it. And in any event, we can't afford to wait a hundred years. Although all religions have the potential for tremendous brainwashing and radicalisation, presently Islam is the primary crutch, source and justification to carry out violence in the West, and it fosters a culture of permission of violence against non-Muslims. We don't want people supporting racist attacks on Muslims in retaliation. Most Muslims fit well into modern society, are perfectly normal, and we don't want them to feel the backlash. But, as always, religion divides. The seeds of suspicion are sown because Islamist-inspired fundamentalists hurt lots of people and praise Allah just before they die, just like any other Muslim. How are Western secularists supposed to differentiate and find the enemy within? Humans are reactive by nature and life works that way. 
It may be unfair, but you can't be perceived as part of a notorious bad crowd and expect no negative stereotyping. And the West has extra reason to be suspicious for two reasons. Firstly, it is disconcerting that lying to non-believers is permitted in Islam under certain circumstances, and this feeds the worry and fear of fifth columnists within, who can interpret Islamic law any way they want. Typically, lying is sanctioned to advance the cause of Islam, in some cases by gaining the trust of non-believers in order to draw out their vulnerability and defeat them. Muslims can lie when it is in their interests to do so, and Allah will not hold them accountable. They can lie without any guilt or fear of accountability or retribution. They can conceal and dissimulate by omission, and they can deceive, not necessarily in a religious context, but to gain political or legalistic advantage, whereby a believing individual can deny his faith or commit otherwise illegal or blasphemous acts, or sometimes use coercion. Sometimes extremists use this get-out clause, and when confronted or challenged, the race, minority and victim cards are sometimes played with impunity, and it is hard to differentiate sometimes between genuine cases and lies. A particularly great Western society, because often in Muslim-majority countries, there are few or no minority rights. And secondly, while many moderate Muslims say they support Western values, integration and secularism, this is questionable. A recent poll of young British Muslims showed that a third wanted to live under Sharia law and believed that anyone who leaves the faith should be put to death for apostasy. 68% thought that if their neighbours insulted Islam, they should be arrested and prosecuted. 78% thought that the Danish cartoonists should be prosecuted. These people may pay lip service to Western values, but they have not got a clue about what constitutes civil society. This is not just against free speech, it is plain hypocrisy. It is running with the hare and chasing with the hounds. Politicians and Muslim moderates generally say those that commit acts of terrorism have nothing to do with the Muslim religion. If we accept though that, say, ISIS and the Paris attackers are not really Muslims, what then do we make of the hundreds of Afghan villagers who recently demonstrated the support of the Charlie Hebdo attackers in Uruzgan province on 11th of January 2015? By this logic, they are also not real Muslims. Likewise, a massive global poll of Muslim opinion by the Pew Foundation last year found that 89% of Pakistani Muslims support stoning for adultery, whilst 86% of Egyptians and 82% of Jordanian Muslims support the execution of those who leave Islam. Are they not really Muslims either? So whilst most British Muslims are peaceful, many are simultaneously anti-secular. The unenlightened view that the law should intervene to prevent certain acts of blasphemy is extremely widespread. Describing Muslims who hold this view as peaceful does not really tell us anything meaningful about their ideology or their politics. Anyone who wants to use the force of the state to protect their feelings is a part of the problem. A problem we mask when we limit our discussion with an arbitrary and meaningless delineation of violent and peaceful Muslims. Peaceful is not enough to foster a strong functioning society. There must be a deeper foundation of secular shared values, but there is a trenchant strand of anti-secularism amongst peaceful Muslims from which terrorism emanates and which poses serious problems for those who campaign for an enlightened secular free society. Really, we need to find out what proportion of British Muslims are opposed to core secular values and the freedom to apostatize. The overwhelming majority may not ever act upon this view, but we must raise the bar higher than mere absence of violence. Some British Muslims campaign for a secularised, liberal or non-literalist interpretation of the Islamic faith, and the media should call them for what they are, liberal or secular Muslims. Adopting the lazy, peaceful description allows a complacent evasion of the underlying problem and obscures a deeper malaise in society. We are facing our own unique version of a culture war and we should get our terminology straight now so that at least the secular Islam proposed by reformers gets the tools and support they need. Instead of arguing about what constitutes true Islam and on which Muslims are not actually Muslims, 
practice, which ironically is popular among jihadists themselves, a more intellectually honest and also effective approach would be to state clearly that Islam, like any Abrahamic religion, is open to a spectrum of interpretations ranging from violent and intolerant through to non-violent and liberal. The best way for the politicians and civil servants to avoid fueling anti-Muslim extremism and to rebuild trust amongst the nervous populace would be to tell the voters the truth. Islam, like any religion, can be a vehicle for good or bad, depending what its followers make of it. So whilst moderate Muslims get up in arms when a clear distinction is not made between them and the extremists, we have to be sceptical. We know it was demented hostility to freedom that caused the Paris killers to murder the Charlie Hebdo staff in Paris for mocking the prophet. Many moderates will condemn the killings, yet simultaneously condemn the cartoonists. You cannot have it both ways. You either believe in free speech and accept you will be offended sometimes, or not. There are no buts. You cannot condemn the attacks whilst simultaneously chastising the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists for provoking the wrath of Muslims any more you can tell a rape victim she provoked her attacker by wearing a miniskirt. As Salman Rushdie says, the moment you declare a set of beliefs immune from criticism, satire, derision or contempt, freedom of thought becomes impossible. It is certain for the foreseeable future that any time you watch this video, a new atrocity will have been committed in the name of Islam. The West must insist the Muslim diaspora answers this question. What is more offensive to a believer? The murder, torture, enslavement and acts of war and terrorism being committed today in the name of Muhammad or the production of drawings, films and books designed to mock the extremists and their vision of what Muhammad represents? If you do not come down on the side of freedom of conscience and freedom of expression and say it is anyone's right to draw a cartoon of the prophet, then you are guilty of supporting the murderers who killed the Charlie Hebdo staff because you helped facilitate them. And denial and appeasement of this issue for the sake of community cohesion is not just self-defeating, it is dangerous. Every day, secular society is under attack. It is chipped away at just that tiny bit more in issues concerning a school, or with dress code, or food, or alcohol. We must take individual complaints about the cultural undermining of secularism collectively, or we risk not identifying patterns, such as the way the Rotherham Council ignored warnings about the systematic grooming of young white girls in its care by men of Pakistani descent. Martyrdom and jihad is a mainstream notion for a significant minority to subject or kill infidels. Yet it is almost as if it is taboo to notice this. Does the Muslim community provide shelter and logistical support for fundamentalists? Yes. Moderates aid and abet in areas of law, dress and finance. Moderates are blinded by moderation. When a bomber blows himself up, moderates say, well, that isn't my religion. Moderation is bankrupt. The question is, how can true secular Muslims, along with the rest of society, restrain their members from extremism? We will look at this in greater detail in the final part of the course. So while you can argue that the core principle of Islam is non-violence, you can just as easily interpret the core as a call to wage jihad. And we are at war with Islamic fundamentalism. However, all that attacking Islam alone does is pile fuel on the Christian war machine's fire and encourage division in society. We cannot allow any religion to exert or influence political control, be they Muslim, Christian or Jew. Look at any of the Abrahamic religions history and you'll see countless lives lost and ruined. They're all evil. As atheists and humanists, we believe that every single person on the planet has certain rights. Religion in its entirety is the enemy here, and to single out one exclusively merely helps to continue the cycle. All religions are guilty of crimes against humanity, be that last week or a thousand years ago. Time is irrelevant. By dismissing one crime because it's old, or because one Abrahamic religion is more moderate nowadays than another, all you're doing is allowing the cycle to continue. People say that religion has its place, and as long as it is peaceful, it should be free to practice, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. But we have seen how moderation can provide cover for extremists, either unintentionally or deliberately. And of course, some religions are worse than others. 
We should not have to pretend to be even-handed when discussing radical Islam. No one but a moral relativist would say that Quakerism and Wahhabism are equally as bad. The Jain religion in India has 10 million followers and at the core is non-violence. They would have to work hard to bend principles and it is for the same reason there are no Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers. There are very few of us who lie awake at night worrying about the Amish. While they are as silly as any religion and need to be consigned to the dustbin of history, they are not a direct threat. So what are the alternatives to believing? Many say they are neither believers or atheists, but agnostics. We often call many of these tooth fairy agnostics. They don't really believe in tooth fairies, but accept it is pretty unlikely. And they will say they believe in God for the same sort of reasons. You can say a teapot revolves around the sun, but it is pretty unlikely. If you are of this inclination and want to come out, some people say they are not atheist, but humanist or naturalist. Perhaps you would like to use the term non-theist. God can be shorthand for that part of physics we don't understand yet, like Einstein or Hawking's use. Or you may decide to go the whole way and become not just an atheist, but like us, an anti-theist who believe that organised religion is actually harmful to mankind's progress. The philosopher Daniel Dennett has a series of questions for those questioning their faith. He first asks, do you believe that Jesus is literally the son of God, an old guy in the clouds with a beard? Most people say, well, no, but in a metaphoric or symbolic way, I still believe in God. If you then ask them, do you believe God literally listens to your prayers and intervenes in people's lives? For instance, if two tennis players both pray to the same God, do you think the God weighs up who to support, given the level of homage? Is God on our side in war, or is he on the side of a certain set of football match supporters? Well, most people say, no, if you put it like that, don't think he does. Thirdly, he asks, do you believe in creationism, that God created all creatures, great and small, just as they are? Most people say, well, no, that was evolution, but there's still something divine. There's still some sort of divine force. Well, we can feel a force, just like in Star Wars. I believe it's fantasy, don't you? We are atheists, and like religious people, we believe there is some force that governs the whole universe and protects our lives. Yes. It's called gravity. The common response of fair-minded people, once you get them past all the rituals, is that God is a concept in people's minds that enriches the spirits and inspires them. Now, if you believe this, you are definitely an atheist. God is not a concept. The concept of God is a concept. A cup of coffee is not a concept. The concept of a cup of coffee is a concept. I believe the concept of a God exists and I am an anti-theist. In fact, I believe the concept of thousands of gods exists. Does that make me a polytheist? The concept of God makes some people lead better lives, but there are better ways. This is a brand new age for religion and for mankind. We don't want to demolish religion, but we do want the God myth to be semi-transparent and it needs to be moved on, like Santa Claus, towards myth. God in heaven, sitting on a throne, is already a fossil, and religion knows this. To believe without illusions is hardest and most dangerous, but it's also the most worthwhile. Many atheists are leading fulfilling lives with purpose. We prefer logical conjecture based on overwhelming observable evidence. We try to be honest, kind, and treat others like we would like to be treated. Isn't that more important than belief? According to religions, if you don't accept the right set of proclamations, then you go to hell no matter how good a person you are. That is a perverse rationalisation. It is liberation to free yourself from primitive superstitious nonsense. Science learns, whereas any religion says it is perfect and has all the answers. To have an eternal, unchanging, tyrannical authority is to be a slave. The beginning of emancipation is to get off your knees and repudiate this antique serfdom and all the contemptible and often laughable superstitions it requires for its maintenance. The discussion about what is noble, true and pure is the only one worth having. The offer of certainty and impermeable faith is not worth having. Atheists feel they haven't understood enough and are always on the edge of a great harvest wisdom and knowledge. Do you think you should live by delusion, by accepting an imaginary but comforting absolute authority?
push it to one side, however tempting it is. Don't take it as a gift. Think of it as a poison chalice. There is much more happiness, truth, beauty and wisdom that will come to you by thinking for yourself. Atheists believe in life before death, not life after death. When we're dying, we don't expect our fears to overcome our reason. Emancipate yourself from an imaginary celestial dictatorship and you take the first step to becoming free. We don't want people to live without wonder and majesty, but the Hubble telescope is better than a burning bush. We need to develop a society that is self-aware and self-critical. This is entirely different from faith, supernatural or revelation. By all means, address the spiritual aspect of life. Let people search for self-awareness through great music, art or literature, or through introspection, contemplation and meditation to gain inner peace and contentment so they can feel happiness rather than constantly pursuing gratification to feel good, instant or otherwise. But only by calling religion for what it is now, myth and superstition, can we hope for a better tomorrow. The only solution to irrationality is the rejection of it. It is not a measure of good health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. The truth will set you free. That's what it says in the Bible. But there's a different opinion on what's right and wrong. Religion discourages people from reasoning and scientific understanding. And religious leaders hide behind their sanctity. That's why we need to change things. And in the final part four, we will suggest how.